This is an important slide that we will probably revisit multiple times throughout the semester. For much of the rest of the semester, the content presented in the methods textbook is specific numerical methods that are used to solve various types of problems. We begun the class talking about some important definitions of model classification and some review of some analytical methods and tools in MATLAB that you should already be familiar with. We'll move on by laying a foundation for some basic principles for developing mathematical models of chemical and biological processes. These include theoretical models and empirical models. The methods that are used to solve these problems are categorized in the colored boxes in the middle and top of this slide. We'll begin with studying methods for solving algebraic equations of a single variable. That's the subject of methods chapter 3. By the end of the semester, we will have introduced all of the methods listed in these other boxes, each for solving different types of mathematical models. We'll talk about solving systems of algebraic equations. We'll talk about analytical and numerical tools for model discrimination. Then we'll cover numerical differentiation and integration, initial value problems, boundary value problems, matrix eigenvalue problems, and finally partial differential equations. You probably don't know what most of the words on this slide mean at this point, but this will be a great guide for you as you prepare and as you go through the semester. You should be able to describe, define, and differentiate among all of these techniques by the end of the semester. Know how to use them, when to use them, and what their relative advantages and disadvantages are. Many of the methods whose names you see here rely on or expand upon other methods that you will have already learned. In particular, the methods that we'll use for solving algebraic equations of a single variable are going to be applied again and again throughout the semester as we learn to solve these other types of problems. I have used almost all of the methods listed on this slide in my research and my professional career as an engineer. So by introducing these methods, this class will provide you with a set of valuable tools that you'll be able to use for the rest of your life. The methods for solving equations of a single variable, that is, equations that can be written in this form, are all essentially root-finding methods. That is, we're looking for the value of x that satisfies this equation for some particular function of x. These are broadly classified as either bracketing methods or open methods. We'll talk about two bracketing methods, bisection and the false point or regular falsy method, and we'll talk about three open methods, the fixed point method, Newton's method, and the secant method. We'll also talk about the MATLAB function F0. All of these methods have both algebraic and graphical interpretations. And your textbook does an excellent job of showing you the graphical interpretation that supports the algebra. All of you are engineers and can think mathematically. But for some of you, it's much easier to interpret things like these plots than it is to interpret things like equations that describe them. For others of you, Interpreting the MATLAB code and the logical sequence of steps is intuitive. Ultimately, you'll all have to make connections between all three of these abstract representations of these methods. I want you to be able to link the algebra to the picture to the MATLAB code. So I'll continue to point out the analogies between these as we go along. Also, the methods introduced in this chapter are supported by MATLAB scripts or M files, which are presented in the text and which I've posted M files for to the website. To support this idea of making a link between the graphical representation and the algebra, step one of performing the bisection method is to prepare a plot of f of x. Next, we choose an interval with bounds a and b that bracket the desired root that we're looking for. The root should appear on the interval from a to b. The bracketing method will only work if f at a and f at b have opposite signs. The next step is to simply calculate the midpoint of the interval a, b. We'll call that point c1. c1 is our first estimate for the root of the function f that lies between the points a and b. Then we evaluate f of x at the point c1. If f at a and f at c1 have opposite signs, it's assumed that the root that we're looking for lies on that interval. If f at a and f at c1 do not have opposite signs, then the root must be on the interval 
C1, B. So we repeat steps two through four using that interval instead. The midpoint of the new interval will be called C2. That's our second estimate for the root of the function f of x. As we repeat this procedure, the interval containing the root gets cut in half at each step. And as n becomes large, the midpoint of our shrinking interval converges to the root. One of the advantages of the bisection method is that it has very precise error bounds. At each iteration, the root is assumed to be in the new interval. And each new interval has a width that is exactly half of the width of the old interval. Therefore, the absolute value of the error on the root at the nth iteration is known explicitly. When n equals 1, this formula gives the absolute error of our estimate for the root on the original interval from a to b. For higher n, the error gets cut in half n times. We can solve this equation for n to find the number of iterations required to achieve an estimate with a desired error bound epsilon. The next bracketing method that we'll discuss is called the false point or regula falsi method. Again, we want to begin by plotting the function f of x and then choosing an interval. We'll call this interval a1 and b1 bracketing the desired root. Again, f at a1 and f at b1 should have opposite signs as shown here. The regular falsi method is similar to the bisection method up until this point. Now, instead of choosing the midpoint as the estimate for the root as we did with the bisection method, we find the x-intercept of the line connecting the points a1, f at a1, and b1, f at b1. The intercept of that line is our first estimate for the root, we call c1. Next, we evaluate f at c1, and similar to the bisection method, if f at a1 and f at c1 have opposite signs, then as they do here, then we assume that the root lies on the interval a1, c1. If f at a1 and f at c1 do not have opposite signs, f at b1 and f at c1 are chosen as the next interval. Again, successive estimates of c converge to our desired root. This diagram shows three iterations. First finding the intercept of the line connecting a1 f at a1 to b1 f at b1, then finding the intercept of the line connecting a1 f at a1 to the point c1 f at c1. That's our second estimate for the root. And in the third iteration, we find the intercept c3 of the line connecting a1 f at a1 to c2 f at c2. These bracketing methods are very robust but they do require that the function f changes sign at the root, which is not always the case. In the next video, we'll introduce what are called the open methods for root finding.